vibrancy and health of our democracy depends on each of us using and practicing our freedoms. One of those freedoms, freedom of speech, that, is the na that this National Week of Programming has honored is a cornerstone of our democracy. My name is Rebecca Lazor. I'm the executive director at the new First Amendment Museum at the Gannett House in Augusta. Free Speech Week celebrated this year from the October 22nd through the 28th is a national campaign to increase awareness about free speech and its value in a democracy. During the week, individuals, schools, and organizations throughout the country host events and exercise their free speech rights and the highlight the importance of the First Amendment. The strength of our democracy increases further when we each think about what our own voice is and where it fits into the fabric of our nation's many communities. Honing in and practicing the ways that you can use your voice through your free, through your free speech rights and the ways that you can challenge ideas you don't agree with or bolster the causes that you care deeply about. These are actions that you may start at home bring forth in your community, and in turn use to support a living democracy. Collecting and sharing and inspiring this kind of intentional participation in our democracy is the work of the First Amendment Museum, a new Maine-based project right in the heart of our capital city in Augusta. We hope you'll get involved and be a part of this organization, so look us up on social media and on Facebook and on the web. We're glad you're here this afternoon as we close out a week of programming. The collaboration between the First Amendment Museum, uh, the Portland Media Center where we are today, WMPG and the New England First Amendment Coalition has been a chance to bring together advocates for free speech with communi community members to talk about these issues. The week kicked off in Augusta with an open house that featured discussion rooms on three areas of free speech, online speech, political speech, and uh, student speech. Guests joined informal conversations with experts in the rooms. Throughout the week and even through the month, WMPG and Portland Media Center have featured on-air programming on free speech. So today, we pull together what we have heard and some of the questions that people have asked about uh, the current state of free speech in this country. And we pose those questions to this panel. We'll start off with introductions and a brief opening response from the panel um, to our moderator's first question. Uh, then we'll present video questions that have been gathered by the Portland Media Center um, and questions that have been collected on index cards throughout the week and at the opening event. Our moderator this evening is Matt Storin. As you see in your program, Storin was editor of the Boston Globe from 1992 to 2001. He began his journalism career at the Daily News in Springfield, Massachusetts, and later joined the Globe's newsroom. He covered the Congress and the White House and served as city editor and Asian bureau chief during his time at the newspaper. He also worked for US News and World Report and the Chicago Sun-Times and the Maine Times. He now lives in Camden, Maine, and he is the, president, the vice president of the Camden Conference, which uh, presents foreign policy discussions every year in February. So thank you for being here and doing this with us. Thank you, Rebecca. So before I introduce our excellent panel, I think it probably would be wise to recite the topic, which is the First Amendment of our Constitution. And it goes as follows. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And as Rebecca said, we will uh, have a preliminary discussion and then we'll take questions that primarily will come from the audience, uh, from the, those who had been in Augusta and those who have filed uh, questions with us previously. And I may throw in a question or two myself. Um, so, to introduce the panel, beginning on, on my right, Ellen Alderman, is an attorney and author. She's a former entertainment attorney who has written extensively uh, about civil rights. She's co-author of two books with Caroline Kennedy, whom some of you may have heard of. Uh, 
She is uh, as well the author of articles on a variety of civil rights topics, and she most recently has worked as a voter protection attorney in Maine and currently is the head of the Maine State Suffrage Centen Centennial uh, Commemoration. So welcome, Ellen. Uh, Chet Lunner is a former journalist and political consultant. He has been on both sides of the camera and both sides in some ways of the issue we're discussing today. He's been a Maine newspaper editor, a U.S. congressional chief of staff, a correspondent for USA Today, a cabinet-level press secretary, and a political campaign manager. So he brings a wide variety of experience to this discussion. Uh, Benjamin Piper is an attorney at Pretty, Pretty Flaherty here in Portland. His media practice includes representation of the news media and First Amendment defamation and privacy issues and freedom of information matters. Before joining Pretty Flaherty, Piper served as law clerk to the Honorable John A. Woodcock, Jr. at the United States District Court, District of Maine. And while in law school at the University of Wisconsin, he served as managing editor of the Wisconsin International Law Journal. It's always good to have a badger on a panel, I think. And uh, finally, uh, Daniel Pencini, Pen Penici, <laughs> I even asked how to pronounce it, and I still screwed it up. Uh, is a professor at the University of Southern Maine. He primarily teaches mass media and mass communications. He has published numerous articles on a wide variety of mass communication topics, including college radio and television, new media use in classrooms, media education, service learning, and winning strategies for media. Panici also serves on the editorial board for the journal Mass Communications, Mass Communication and Society, and reviews manuscripts for the Journal of Broadcasting and Electronic Media. So as Rebecca indicated, we're going to have the panel address a general question first, and then we will get into more specifics. And that question is, where do our First Amendment freedoms stand today? Are these freedoms, particularly that of free speech, currently threatened in any way and if so, how? And why don't we begin with you, Ellen? Well, I would say yes, they are currently threatened today um, on several levels. Uh, we have the most obvious with our um, president and other politicians calling the press the enemy of the people, but I also think on an existential level because one of the foundational tenets of the First Amendment, one of the basic principles is the marketplace of ideas and that if we allow all ideas out in the marketplace to compete then the truth will emerge and we still hear this I heard the head of the New York Times saying that the other day that the truth will out but if we have people who are starting to deny that there is such a thing as truth that there is such a thing as an objective fact that is true then what happens to the idea that the First Amendment is based on? So I think that, to me, the idea that there's no objective truth is probably an existential threat to free speech. Right, right. And I, I would tend to agree with that. But on the other hand, uh, would we stipulate that the president is exercising her, his First Amendment rights in using the phrase enemies of the people? Absolutely. Whether you, but having the right to do something and it being the right thing to do are two very different right, things. Right. And for the president, I mean, we can get into this later, but the president holds a unique position the, and indeed. a unique Does responsibility, indeed. and that's not what he should be saying. I'm Chad, sure how would how would you answer this? Over here. Well, I think that uh, first of all, <laughs> none of the amendments are absolute. I mean, there's that's why we're able to have these discussions, and there's a gray area between the. Uh, uh, left and right of these uh, interpretations. So we have to be careful, I think, to, to understand that. You can't yell fire in a theater is the, is the notorious example of that. Um, but the whole purpose of having a First Amendment and this free flow of information is to make sure our citizens are knowledgeable and aware and can make the decisions that this American democracy allows them to. It's not some philosophical, uh, it's, a, it's a very practical reason to have it 
Uh, and the, the second point I would uh, make is that before we go too far in any of these discussions, I always like to stipulate that the First Amendment is everybody's amendment. It's not for journalists and lawyers, although that's the people you hear talking about it mostly. It's an American citizen's right. So we all have a role, as Rebecca said in her opening remarks, in, uh, in practicing it uh, as just as good American citizens. Good. Ben. I would certainly agree with some of the points that have been made about the current threats to the First Amendment, but I, I would add that there is um, cause for hope because from a legal standpoint, uh, the First Amendment has benefited from some very thoughtful interpretation uh, in the second half of the 20th century, um, you know, a lot of it having to do with Watergate and the Vietnam War, and it has really shored up the First Amendment in a lot of ways, and that still stands as, as precedent. and there's not an imminent threat of that being changed anytime soon, but the, the shape of the courts is changing and the tenor in this country is changing. So I think we need to be mindful of the, the law as it stands, um, but also thoughtful about what could happen in the future if uh, this kind of uh, zeitgeist of attitudes toward the First Amendment continue. Dan? Yeah, I, I look at it not only as my, my co-panelists look at it, but. I look back at 1919 when we had the, really the first interpretation of the First Amendment, when we jailed someone for passing out 15,000 leaflets to say you have a right not to enlist in the Army. I think we've come a long way, uh, but we also do have this ebb and flow of these interpretations that um, really do matter. And I think it really does matter who's on the Supreme Court, and I think that's what one of the issues is, is sort of what's the makeup of the Supreme Court, so therefore where, where are those elements or those areas where our, our rights in the first speech are going to be threatened? It depends upon what the Supreme Court wants to do. Right. Uh, so I think, I think we've come a long way, and I think certainly with all of social media and everybody sort of having misinterpretations of what the First Amendment is. I mean, we should probably go back to that, too. I mean, you know, there's a lot of polls out there that, you know, majority of people can't even identify the five rights in the First Amendment, let alone free speech, right? right. And then you look at what should we do about it, and there's a, more and more people are saying we should probably censor more. There should be more uh, laws to uh, deal with hate speech, for instance, or to deal with these kind of offensive language that we see. So I think that that's more of a danger uh, than it necessarily is of that is going to be going away. It's sort of the attitudes about what is free speech and what can I say and can't say. Right. We're, we're going to have a question soon uh, from the videos about uh, a government employee or government employees' issues they face. I don't actually know the question before they come up. But I did think I would clarify here for the purposes of the discussion. The amendment says Congress shall make no law. Right. And am I right that it's really a matter of government intrusion and intervention? If I were to say before we did this panel, I don't want you discussing pornography. Uh, that You might not like that, but that is not a violation of your First right. Amendment rights, correct? Because right. it's just among us. Correct. Uh, well, let's take that question from a government employee or on the subject of government employees as our first video question. Hi, my name is Joanne Lester, and I'm a government employee. My question is, how does free speech affect me as a government employee? Okay, that's, that's about what we expected. It took us a long time to get there. Well, first of all, it's what you said, which is um, you have the right, the First Amendment right, because you're a government employee. A private employee does not, and it's something, I wrote a book on the Bill of Rights, and that is something that almost nobody understands, that distinction. Um, they talk about it with, oh, well, the baseball player's free speech rights or something, it's, it's different. Right. But for the government employees, and you can probably speak to this more, but there's a welter of regulations that um, govern all of this. The Hatch Act, you probably dealt with for federal employees, um, but- Explain what the Hatch Act is for those who don't. It's the one that, well, it's the one that governs the political speech of federal employees, right. which uh, um, members of the current administration have run afoul of, they just didn't understand that you're not supposed to, in your official capacity, um, appear to be campaigning for a political party. And the general rule is that in your official capacity, you do not have the same kind of free speech, but for instance, putting a bumper sticker on your car as long as you don't use your car for <laughs> official businesses, right. would be 
protected speech for you right. as and an employee. Is there a difference between a civil service employee, someone whose job is protected as part of the bureaucracy, or a political appointee, say a cabinet secretary? They are under a different category, at least under the Hatch Act, because they are um, deemed to be on the job 24 hours a day. So right. they fall under a different category, whereas the civil servant has a clear delineation between their official duties and their non-official duties. I mean, right. John Kerry I was giving a speech somewhere and people kept asking him about Trump and the election. And he said, I can't talk about that, which people found surprising. Right. Interesting. There was a, when I was a congressional staffer, I had to carry two phones one for the political uh, discussions mm -hmm. and one for government, uh, you know, uh, job-related right. activities. And then another, there's another gray area in the government er uh, uh, sector about, you know, classified information. You can't, you know, after 9-11, I was the, I directed the communications policy for the federal air marshals and the FAA. And, you know, you wouldn't want people saying, well, how many how many guns do they have and what size are they and what caliber and how many bullets and how many of them are on this flight or that. Those are the sorts of things that get in, in a post 9-11 area, we were, era, we were much more sensitive to than we yes. would have been before. Right, mm. right, correct. Anybody else? Um, while we're just on this general uh, topic, the, uh, as I said before, the, the actual amendment says Congress shall pass no laws. So even though I think you all sort of alluded to some fear of erosion on the principles of the First Amendment, can you envision, like in your lifetimes, that Congress would pass a law that restricted the freedom of speech, not an amendment to the Constitution, mm -hmm. but something which very specifically did reduce or narrow the, the window in which one can make free expression? Well, there's been uh, some discussion from this administration about changing defamation laws. Yes. And, um, right. you know, defamation law has several components. It's partially part of the common law, partially statutory law in various states, um, but largely based in the First Amendment. A lot of the... And explain defamation for those who are not... Really sure. Trained. So defamation law is a, a private cause of action that someone can bring, um, you know, bring a lawsuit against someone for lowering someone else in the esteem of the public um, by saying something disparaging about them. Uh, there are different standards depending on whether the subject of the statement is a public figure or a private figure, um, different standards depending on whether it's a matter of public concern or a matter of uh, private concern. Uh, the standards being uh, constitutionally imposed based on Supreme Court precedent um, essentially, it's more difficult to bring a cause of action for, for a public figure to bring a cause of action and for a cause of action to be brought based on a statement about a matter of public concern. Um, and these heightened standards are matters of, uh, they're grounded in the First Amendment as interpreted, interpreted by the Supreme Court. And I think that would be difficult to change. Um, you know, it, it's conceivable that... Uh, and, a Congress could try to, uh, th there's never been, to my knowledge, a federal defamation law. It's conceivable that um, a Congress could try to impose that and perhaps try to change the meaning of defamation. Huh, um, the meaning of defamation hasn't really been subject to um, First Amendment scrutiny, but if it were overly broad, it's possible that that could be subject to a, a First Amendment challenge. But we should point out that even though this current administration has, and President Trump has specifically talked about trying to loosen up the defamation laws. He just benefited from them in the lawsuit against him by right. um, Stormy Daniels. That's correct. And it was struck down, saying it's he's a public, it's a public, public figure, public issue, political issue, and the hyperbolic speech and political campaigns um, needs to be free and hard-fisted and all of that. So he benefited from the laws that he was saying were too loose. So. Right. <clears throat> I, I could see Congress, particularly in this area, with the standard for public officials is that you have the threshold for defamation. You have to prove a reckless disregard for the truth, you know, yes. actual malice. Right. I could see the courts maybe taking something to lessen that and make it easier for public figures to bring something forward, whether they'll win or not. 
uh, you know, so for private citizens, it's just uh, negligence, right? Right. Uh, so I could see maybe the uh, some in Congress wanting to lower the standard or lower that that criteria of actual malice for public figures, you know, down a little bit. So it, it's that sort would of be like huge. it would be yeah. huge, but it'd be censorship by the raised eyebrow or censorship by you know, sort of mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, trying to stop distribution of of information in that way. And it's interesting the way you put that, Dan, at first because. As we see with so many things, the most contentious issues in our society, they are modified or restricted by the courts and not by the Congress. Now, you, you alluded to both, but mm -hmm. the first thing you said was you could see the courts doing it. Mm. And that probably is, if it were to happen, God forbid, the more likely avenue through which it would occur. Okay, I'll go now to the question I tried to read before, and I'm a little <laughs> hesitant about the, <laughs> the uh, video questions, but we will return to them. Uh, so this question came from uh, a, a, me a member of the public. If you are recording the police uh, stopping someone, uh, and you're re recording it on your phone, and the police tell you to put your phone down so you can't record, is that against your right to free speech? I think generally, yes. They, uh, law enforcement is subject to transparency. Now, there are exceptions to this. Um, as has been alluded to earlier, the First Amendment is not absolute, and you know, uh, ongoing law enforcement investigations is one thing that can be protected. You know, it can be sealed from the public. Right. Um, certain grand jury um, proceedings can be sealed from the public. Um, but if law enforcement proceedings are happening in the open on a city street, then individual citizens have a right to record that. It reminds me of, of something that uh, irritates me sometimes that increasingly, now it doesn't happen every day, but increasingly a reporter approaches a public figure, particularly let's say the president, the vice president, the governor, with a question not in a press conference, but maybe in a hallway somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now in the Congress, in the Capitol uh, building of the United States, this happens every day and pretty much without incident. But in some state capitals and sometimes away from the U.S. Capitol, the security detail for that individual will wall off the reporters. And in some occasions, I think in West Virginia, on one occasion, actually arrested a reporter. Mm -hmm. And then we have the, uh, the situation in uh, Montana where the congressman uh -huh. actually body slammed the reporter. Mm -hmm. um, where do these sorts of things fit in with the First Amendment? Does, does a reporter always have a right to interview and ask a question of a public official? They always have a right to ask a question. They don't have a right to an answer. Right. And they are right. also subject to the same laws of trespass and stalking and harassment that everyone is right. subject to. And that seems to be the obvious place to draw the line. Yeah. And obviously the things that are beyond it are like body slamming a reporter. Right. <laughs> that is not protected by the first amendment. <laughs> I think where, uh, and, and uh, Chet made reference to 9-11 before, I think after that period of time, uh, where security considerations became more prominent, uh, law enforcement and uh, Secret Service folks do have a little more leeway or given mm -hmm. more leeway by the public to take these actions. And you could argue interminably whether they did the right thing or not, but they're right. probably going to get away with it. And, uh, I mean, the First Amendment does not give you the right to impede someone's travel. And, yes. you know, not to apologize for my <clears throat> buddies in law enforcement again, but the, you, we have no idea what the context is. They're the ones who hear about threats. Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan was shot by a guy standing in the press pool. Uh, so right. it's, not, it's a real concern a sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and of course, again, it's a gray area whether you're doing it too much or not, but there are legitimate reasons uh, and nobody has to have a press conference in the, in the middle of a hallway. I think the fact that these are, uh, issues are still argued rather publicly uh, is probably a good sign for this country that these things do get, at least they get discussed. We may not like the way they come out in some cases, but it's, it's not a given that, the, that law enforcement can inject itself in between a public official and a, and a reporter. Uh, now here's a question that I think, uh, maybe it's not the most sophisticated question, but I think a lot of people uh, 
uh, a lot of our listeners and people in the audience might have this question about the First Amendment. Can I say anything I want, wherever I want to, to whomever I want to, under protection of free speech? No. 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 <laughs> but, I think, no. but I think that goes to some of the misunderstandings that It, it you does. And I, and I think to. in the general area, and you guys jump in because you probably know more than I do the laws, but, but there are time, place, and um, manner restrictions. So you can restrict based on time. And it gets to that. I think the opening you were mentioning... Uh, whether, whether we could have protests right down, right down the White House. Uh, you know, if that's a place that the, the courts decide that it's not because it's going to interfere with the functioning of the day-to-day -day operations of the White House, you can move those protesters. So there are time, place, and manner kind of restrictions. And I think that's the general area. As long as it's content neutral, um, that is that, you know, the government is not uh, privileging one type of speech over another, uh, you know, I think you can have that. But I think it's that going back that you don't have the right to yell fire in a crowded theater, right? To falsely uh, yell to fire. To falsely, exactly. I, I was just reading that this morning. Exactly. <laughs> yes, if there is a fire, please yell and yell loud. I'm going to get that in there. You yes, are falsely. allowed to yell it when the building's on Good fire. Point. <laughs> Good point. But, you, but falsely yelling fire for the obvious reason, it causes it's, it's dangerous. So right. that we have that too, the imminent and likely harm. Um, that's, the, that's a very difficult one to right. determine. But a defamation is a restriction on speech. You can't defame people you can, um, under, under the definition of defina defamation. And there are a lot of the time, manner, place. There, as you said, all of our rights under the Bill of Rights have restrictions. We, we've been dealing with that at USM and our, our campus in terms of uh, place. Or, you know, we have obviously people can come and, uh, and, and speak and protest and do what they want, but they're interfering with the classroom by yelling and the noise kind of things, and they mm. can be restricted to move somewhere else in that way. Right. Um, well, since you've introduced campus issues, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot that is happening there, and there's a whole issue of trigger issues and what a, a professor can say in a classroom, whether the professor needs to warn the students, whether students can object to a particular topic. And then the broader question in public forums uh, that like we saw in Middlebury College mm. where a conservative speaker and not really a radical conservative speaker was hounded practically out of the auditorium. Uh, Dan, what do you think of these issues since you kind of grapple with those on a regular basis? Oh, I do. I do. I, I'm one for to counter speech with more speech. Um, I don't like censorship. I don't think it's right, to, particularly on campuses. I think this is the place where you struggle with ideas, if you're ideally with the marketplace of ideas. Um, so I'm not in favor of trigger warnings or safe zones or speech codes. Uh, I think those are forms of censorship, quite honestly. Um, but there is that, and I want to be sensitive to those who might, uh, uh, if there's offensive language or if someone can be psychologically harmed. I mean, we have to take that into consideration, but I don't know how censorship would, would, would solve those kind of issues in that way. Um, there have been a few court cases. Uh, I look more at on the, on the high school level, for instance, for freedom of speech on Hazelwood versus uh, Kilmeyer, where you can, administrators can restrict speech. That's starting to kind of come now into the college campuses. There's been a couple cases uh, where administrators have censored the, 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 the newspaper on the campus, uh, and it's been upheld, at least in Illinois it was. Um, so those are the kind of things I think I worry a little bit more. Now, bringing in a controversial speaker, um, I think that we should be doing that. I think that, that that should be right, but we should do it where there's, uh, you know, there's not going to be violence, people could be protected. Uh, but that's the only way truly to kind of, uh, you know, truth, let truth and falsehood grapple. Uh, I think we have to do that. And also, because the controversial speaker's coming to campus doesn't mean you have to go listen to the controversial speaker. Yeah. Right? You have a right to not listen. <laughs> yeah. That's also part of the First Amendment. Yeah. It's hard to distinguish, is it not, between what we might call hate speech and something that is insensitive or perhaps has objectionable aspects, but there's a difference, right? Um, and how would you define, what is hate speech, really? Anybody want to take that? No, there was a good example in the, in the news recently with this Megyn Kelly uh, yes. hostess of a TV show yeah. who said something at least awkward and, and you know, sort of stupid for somebody in that position, but not necessarily with any hateful intent, and she lost her job, you know, yeah. from the outrage. Uh, so it's a, they're, they're a real practical... Uh, that's an excellent example, uh, actually. Examples. I, I agree you with could that. also say that's the marketplace of ideas at work, 
because that she was not working a public position. There was no um, right. government entity that took her job away. Exactly. It was the public saying, we find this um, offensive and she shouldn't be in that position. Whether that's right or wrong, I think that's a, a societal question more than a legal question. Um, but I think there is, um, there's definitely a push against hate speech coming strongly from the university, as, as Dan mentioned. And you know, the Supreme Court has largely allowed hate speech. A, a, uh, some examples are the Westboro Baptist Church, right. um, which they've allowed to picket uh, veterans' um, funerals, saying some yes. very indecent, offensive things. Right. There have been um, Nazi marches through Skokie, um, mm -hmm. Illinois, many years ago that were allowed, even though there, there was a large Jewish community. Um, and it could be seen as very hateful. Um, I think, as Dan mentioned, the best way to counter that and the way that's contemplated by the First Amendment right. is to counter it with speech of your own. But you need to distinguish that speech from silencing. Because I think one thing that's been going on at universities is there's been a blockading of auditoriums. There's been use of sound machines to muffle out speech that's uh, been yes. deemed offensive. Right. And silencing is not a First Amendment right. Speaking against speech you find offensive is. Excellent point. Uh, we're going to have actually another. I'm going to take a chance on a video <laughs> question. There is one on hate speech, which may uh, duplicate some of what you've already said. But while we're queuing that up, I, I did want to uh, just say that with regard to the Megyn Kelly thing, you know, as someone who held a kind of quasi public position for a number of years, and I had to uh, speak in, in various forums and on various issues. You know, once you get into race, there's got to be a red light blinking. You know, be very careful what you say and how you say it. And that a person, particularly a person being paid $69 million over five years, ought to be able to distinguish that. I don't mean to pile on to Megyn Kelly, but uh, she had a little bit of a history in this area. And it's kind of remarkable that she would get herself into that kind of trouble. Uh, now, let's uh, go to the question with, with video question on hate speech. What is hate speech, and is it legal? Should it be permissible? Even though it's someone's opinion, and people are entitled to their opinions, but it's a hurtful opinion to others, is it legal? A little bit duplicative, but a slightly different way you well, put it. It's certainly protected. Uh, hate speech is protected by the courts because, again, it's content. You know, if you start saying these words are hateful, uh, or these phrases are hateful, then you're now starting to carve out content. Uh, it goes back to the 1960, I think it's 68 decision of Brandenburg v. Ohio, which then get to the, you know, as long as your speech is not uh, inciting imminent lawless action, right, that it's imminent that someone's going to go out and do harm, it's protected. Uh, in that way. We came a long way with that definition. We used to have bad tendency, then it was clear and present danger. Now it's just like this, or sort of so as we've gone from 1919 to the present, we've actually given more and more protection to speech because of that, uh, you know, being content neutral and that as long as you're not inciting uh, the likelihood of imminent danger uh, or action, uh, you're protected in that way. I, I think that was the magic word, at least from a lay standpoint. My understanding is that it's not uh, what you say, it's the intent that you have behind what you mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're incentivizing uh, violence, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a dangerous, that's where it starts to get to be hate speech, as opposed to uh, some of the other examples we've talked about. Somebody is, is sort of the equivalent of hollering fire in a theater, you know, uh, making the mob go crazy yeah. uh, is uh, deliberately and intentionally, I think that's where it starts to get to under that definition. Right. Uh, another topic that comes up often in, uh, at the extremes of this uh, question is pornography. There's a long history of dealing with pornography in the United States, beginning with the printed word years ago and now, of course, more into video. Uh, who, who wants to try to fit that into the context <laughs> of a First <laughs> Amendment discussion? And, and I, so I didn't, for, I didn't prohibit any of you from discussing pornography. You can go ahead and say whatever no. you want. It's not my area of expertise. <laughs> no, I, I, they all say that. Yeah, no, no, I will say, I will say that the courts do have a, a, a clear, uh, not a clear, but a definition oh. of what is obscenity and what is pornography. And obscenity you know, goes back to the Roth, a three-part test. And so there is some delineation between what's obscene and what's pornography. Um, 
I guess the area when it comes to First Amendment is sort of like, should we have that uh, available on the internet, or should that you know be on its own sort of, you know, XXX kind of thing or something like that? I don't know if the panelists want to jump in onto that, but um, you know that that does go back to I, I do believe one of the one of the reasons we have the First Amendment is that as part of our humanity is for expression. Uh, we also have the First Amendment to because it's part of democracy and to help information, but there is that individual reason of that, and, and uh, so whether one is, you know, uh, involved with pornography, I guess that's because that's part of their expression. That's what they're trying to do. But um, I don't really have the the clear the clear distinction in those in some of those areas. I think we'll say the famous ahead. definition of. Pornography, I know it no, when I see, see it. it. Yeah. <laughs> is that Potter Stewart, Justice yeah. Potter Stewart? <laughs> That's how difficult it is to define. And, yeah. and he finally yes. expressed what everybody was thinking, which is, well, I just know it when I see it. It's hard to legally define. But I think there's also a question of how it's being regulated. Um, for example, zoning restrictions that keep strip clubs out of certain areas have been upheld, and those are allowed. Um, you know, if you were trying to prevent publication of all nude images, that would be something different. And um, the standards that have been articulated involve, is there a purely prurient interest um, in the material that's being published? And does it have any redeeming, artistic, expressive, political, or some other valued uh, expressive purpose? And if, if it hits the first thing of prurient interest and has no redemptive uh, side to it, then it, it can be restricted in some way. And the interesting thing, this is one of the few areas where the court explicitly recognizes the quote, evolving standards of decency, that this definition has changed. And to your point, that it has become more protected mm -hmm. in this area, things that would have been considered pornographic and obscene, rather obscene, and you could um, regulate them have changed and the court explicitly recognized that it's communities evolving community standards of decency that they're talking about. And, and when it comes to the internet that's a hard thing to define what is the community standard right because right. if it's being distributed from California do we use California right. community standards or do we use Maine you or, know community uh, standards. Taiwan, so that's, or who knows exactly so, so it's a real real tough area to regulate actually. Well since reasons. we've opened the door on the internet in general. Uh, we had a number of questions from the public that in some way or another dealt with internet liabilities or, or uh, freedoms. So in general, I wonder what the panel thinks that the internet has done for or against the First Amendment and the First Amendment freedoms. I'll give you one example, uh, though it, it, uh, it's not necessarily just a free speech issue, but you all remember, we're all old enough to remember the Pentagon Papers issue where newspapers printed classified, a classified uh -huh. history of the Vietnam War beginning with the New York Times, and there recently was a film about the Washington Post's role in that, and I would uh, hasten to add that the Globe, uh, Boston Globe was the third paper to print the <laughs> Pentagon Papers. <laughs> But, uh, and I had this discussion with Daniel Ellsberg once, who was the person who actually leaked the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times. Today, with the internet, because the issue that they said, you'll remember, was the court came down and said, you can't have prior restraint on what a newspaper can publish. They, they can publish it, and then if you think it's a violation of law or decency, that you can prosecute it. Today, uh, if Daniel Ellsberg wanted to get the Pentagon Papers out, he could have gone to BuzzFeed or anywhere or just put it online himself, and it would be out there in an instant. So there would be no issue. Our, but so how, how is the Internet changing the way that information is governed in our society, if it's governed at all? Well, using your example, um, we used to have, back in our day, gatekeepers yes. like the New York Times yes. and the Boston Globe. And we don't have that anymore because of the Internet. We don't have people who have, and there are plenty of people who think that's a great thing, that there it shouldn't be a handful of elites who are determining this. And um, that's, the, I think, one of the biggest changes is that, it, like, as you said, the Pentagon Papers would be out there 
very quickly yes. now, and there would be nobody having those discussions we saw in the movie, The Post and all, um, in the boardrooms, the gatekeepers discussing whether they should or not, it'll get out. And it's, it's one of the reasons why prior restraint doesn't work, because the internet is showing us what John Milton said hundreds of years ago, is that the, there's no point because it's like shutting the gate to pound up the crows. They're going to fly out. The information is going to get out anyway. And the um, internet, is, to me at least, it seems to have just exacerbated and, ex and accelerated that whole point. And it seems like we're still, of course, in the infancy of the internet. That that there's further change, there, it will evolve as a, right. I mean, I think some of what we're seeing with Facebook and, and yeah, Twitter. Yeah, it's, it's empowered people in a very unusual way. I didn't th think about this before your question, but uh, guys like Edward Snowden are now taking on, ind as individuals, the, the, um, the future of the United States uh, government and its policies. Uh, there's you know, a lot of different examples Snowden just leaped to mind. Instead of that team of people, you know, who meticulously and had uh, ulcer-generating <laughs> meetings in the in the newsroom, conference rooms, surrounded by lawyers, I'm sure who were right. threatening this and that. Right. Uh, that it used to take a lot of people to challenge the the future of the United States policy. Now, as you said, it's just one person can do it instantly. Right. And that's, that's a different shift in the government's relationship to its own citizens. And I think there's, it's been interesting to observe the different uh, reactions to this general uh, pattern that you just described, Chet, that um, if we look back on the, uh, what WikiLeaks first put out, uh, I think that there was a fair amount of acceptance uh, certainly in the press there was, because they were uh, sort of accomplices, the Guardian and the New York Times, the Washington Post actually in the Guardian first. Today, uh, probably perhaps because of the 2016 election and uh, the allegations about what uh, Julian Assange did or didn't do or what role they've had, there seems to be a little revisionist history going on now about whether this broad release of information without more governance is a good idea. Would you, would you agree with that, or is that just my imagination? Well, let me, uh, pardon my jumping back in here, but let Please. me also uh, try to even this out. I, I spoke earlier about the danger of releasing classified information that, that could have really damage uh, and actually cost people their lives in some cases. But on the other hand, I'll give you a little peek behind the curtain. Most of the stuff that came across my desk when I had that kind of a, a, a security clearance was ridiculously overclassified, and people who <clears throat> study this will, yes. you know, there's been reports after reports after reports. It, it, most of it was, I, I couldn't find any reason why it was classified, and uh, a lot of it was just because someone might be embarrassed. You know, that was the, that was the reason. So that complicates things enormously when you're trying to weigh: is this important to release or not? Because you can't always tell whether it should have been classified to begin with. Right. Which that classification is sort of a way of uh, of censoring or or, or yeah, not yeah, yeah allow, allowing information government information to, to get forward right yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly the thing that I always think about with the internet and the First Amendment is I think it's actually been good because it it, it, it spurs a lot of these conversations you know in that way like and we have to ask these kind of bigger questions <laughs> like you know uh, who is a journalist right if we're going to say free press and who who gets that you know. Um, the benefit or, or the more protection, like if we're talking about confidential sources and things like that. So it really is this kind of disruptive technology that really has us, you know, looking in all these kind of areas in terms of privacy. I, I think one of the biggest dangers that getting back to this question of like just releasing information and getting back to the gatekeepers, is that what in my, my, my thinking is that all that information lacks context. Mm. And so then I'm, uh, it's up to my, the individual to make sense of that. And I think sometimes we're either overwhelmed or don't have the faculties to do that or to understand. And I think that's the real danger of just keeping releasing information or undermining the press, you know, in terms of fake, pre fake news and all that. Is that actually that the, the press is there to give context to information, also to help us interpret information uh, in that way. And I think that that's, that's sort of in danger if we just rely just on releasing of information on the internet in that way. Right, right. Yeah, some of the broad release is 
good. But when I read Twitter and, and Facebook sometimes, I, I, I will see an individual tweet or a posting on Facebook, and I'll say, this is the kind of thing that some guy in his cups said at the end of the bar, you know, 30 years ago that never got beyond mm -hmm. the bar room. But now it's out there. The person might have 10,000 followers. In the case of one other difference that strikes me looking at this arrangement we have here, I'm not sure that everyone understands how, you know, we talk a lot about fake news. Everyone understands the mechanics of how real news gets from the bar or the street to the newspaper or the TV right. uh, station, which would be the reporter, you know, is assigned something by an editor who overlooks the work that the reporter does, by another editor that double checks it and the copy desk by another editor who puts the uh, headline on it overseen by the managing editor or executive editor uh, you know there's a there's a very meticulous process that you, that gets to uh, you know the the fact that you see in your local newspaper yes. didn't get there by somebody at the end of the bar tweeting it in by themselves no and i'm glad you said that and i noticed uh, i've noticed as i'm sure you have that increasingly newspapers i think the new york times may be leading the way on this try to explain how they got a story right. later on right uh, for instance the two women who wrote the stories about uh, weinstein that led to the me too movement at the year anniversary they did a long piece about all they went through to get those stories and i think ronan farrow in the new yorker has done the, mm -hmm. the same thing and i think that's a good trend for exactly the reason, Chet, that you were just outlining. Um, Dan, you, you uh, mentioned the P word, and I don't mean pornography, I mean privacy. <laughs> um, the, uh, this is increasingly, and I don't know precisely how, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know how it fits into the topic of the First Amendment, but it certainly is, it's, a, it's at least a kissing cousin. Um, what trends do you see there? What do you think if anything may be done down the road to address the issue of privacy on the internet? In, the, in, the, in Europe, they have addressed it to some oh, extent, GDPR. in that you can uh, have your record cleansed, so to speak, and I forget some of the other aspects so I of it. I think it's the, called the right to be forgotten. Yeah. yeah that's an <laughs> interesting <laughs> phrase. I would love that right. <laughs> yes, yeah, I think a lot yeah. of us would. <laughs> I could see this being regulated from a consumer protection standpoint as well. Um, I think you know, a knee-jerk re reaction that some people have when they say, you know, people are concerned about privacy of things that they post on social med media or elsewhere on the internet, well, you opted in. You, there are terms of service and you opted in to share your information. Um, you should have known that they had the right to disseminate that information, sell it to various entities. But no one actually reads that. No one really understands that. No one thinks about that when they're in their cups and tweeting something out or posting a picture. Um, so I think one way that it could be addressed to kind of balance this tension between, you know, the right of access to this information and privacy is to force these companies to be more forthright um, in their disclosures about what's being used, how it's being used, make, put that in a conspicuous place, not just buried in some terms of use, and uh, remind people, perhaps periodically, uh, when they are using these platforms what they're doing, what the potential consequences are. The new European law does exactly that. It, it, even to the terms of service that instead of going on for seven pages, it has to be concise and clear and uh, readable or they pay huge fines. Are you talking about your personal information or what you actually have posted on Facebook or Twitter? Both. I think oh. data, our personal data and what we post are the lifeblood of these organizations because they make right. their money from We're the product. making a dossier of who we are and targeting advertisements to us. So I think both the information that we share in our profiles and what we like, what we post, what we click on, all of that has consequences for um, kind of the, the profile that they create about us. Yeah, I would draw a distinction between all of that information and what you post. Mm -hmm. At least as a mom, <laughs> I have told my kids anything you type. And, uh, and lawyers will tell clients, do not put anything in an email mm -hmm. or on, face, unless, on Facebook unless you want to see it on a screen in a courtroom, yeah. which is one very dramatic way to put it. But I just, I've always told what my kids since they were very young, because I wrote a book on privacy 20 years ago, which scared the bejesus out of me about what <laughs> was coming. And I said, it's not private. 
the only thing that protects what I post is nobody really cares. <laughs> but if for yeah. some reason somebody wanted to find it, a potential employer, uh, grad school, this is the mom in me speaking, but also a political opponent we've seen, they'll find it. So I would say that for what you post, I, I and the people in the privacy rights organizations don't like to hear me say this, but I actually think that ship has sailed and that's that one of the things is educating people that that information is out there. Your right. preferences, your private information, mm -hmm. that's all very different. Right. But once you speak... Yeah, certainly I think you have to go with the assumption it's not, the internet is not private. The social media platforms are not private. I mean, they're going to be public. But I think there is also somewhat of a generational difference of what is privacy and what we're taught. You know, we're oh, talking, my, my kid's sense of privacy is totally right. different when they're, you know, doing selfies in their bedroom and, you know, sending it out and doing all of that. Um, you know, that, that, that's another issue. It's like, you know, so, so we have these laws that were written for the analog world and we're in right. a digital world. And that's another thing that we, we might want to talk about is sort of how do you operate in the digital world with these analog right. sort of yeah. laws? Uh, you know, and there's some groups that are trying to change things in that way. What are some of the things that are being talked about? Well, in the copyright area, I think the Electronic uh, uh, Freedom Foundation mm -hmm. is looking more at a commons kind of approach that uh, for, for everyone to share more inf information in that way. I think one big thing is just the notion that it's up to the individual to protect your privacy. I mean, we've got that kind of clearly in that way. Uh, uh, we've shifted. It's interesting, you wrote, you wrote a book on privacy 20 years ago? We called it the information superhighway then. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, that you, metaphor didn't right. stick. It's now that. the web. Do, do you yeah. think sort of people's notions of privacy has changed within Absolutely. these 20 years in that Absolutely. way? Yeah. yeah, like what do you think it was before and what do you think it is now? Well, people <laughs> didn't realize that um, people, uh, the, the metaphors we use were people thought that um, emails and information you posted online was like a letter that you sealed up and mailed, mm -hmm. but it's a postcard. And I said, it's no, it's a billboard, <laughs> you know, bec because pe uh, people can get to it. Right. And um, again, a lot of it is protected because nobody's looking. There's so much out there they can't. But if somebody wants to find it for some reason, they'll mm -hmm. be able to. I think this is an example of what I... Uh, Half, a half-formed idea that I mentioned before about the evolving attitudes toward the Internet. And we don't know how that will all play out over time, but I believe that originally an awful lot of people, myself included, looked at Facebook and Twitter as, hey, the, this is great. You know, I get to express myself in any way I want without really realizing they're keeping track of everything right. and for advertising. That's how they make their money. So now we're in a, I think attitudes are changing a lot toward Facebook and Twitter. They're still very popular, they're still making a fair amount of money. But I think down the road, there probably is some regulation that could be in their future. I, I'm, go ahead, well, that's, that's interesting because, you know, we're, we're sort of constitutionally against regulation in this area, uh, traditionally. But the, what, what what surprises me is that the, the it's not self-regulation, but, but uh, lawsuit regulation hasn't kicked in. You know, we, we like to brag about our great ethics and integrity in the newsroom of the traditional newspaper, but one of the other powerful influences was we didn't want to get sued. Right. <laughs> so uh, a lot of that uh, is missing from the current, people don't get sued. Right. Uh, the, the they don't platforms, have assets, in some cases, don't have assets to be sued against. The, the platforms actually are protected by a federal law from 1996, back in the uh, information superhighway days, <laughs> where, they, where they tried to uh, make it, uh, you know, free exchange, which is a legitimate uh, excuse. But nowadays, I'm always surprised to see all these things that are, that are defamation or, or at least very wrong and damaging, that people don't get sued. I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. That would used to be a controlling factor in, the, in traditional news, and it's missing today. Another change that uh, touches on traditional news is, is copyright law. When, uh, in my early days in journalism, if, say, the Boston Globe had a really important exclusive investigation. There would be a little agate line under the byline, say, copyright Globe Newspaper right. Company, which was right. basically, whether it could have actually been matriculated or not, it was a warning against others picking that up 
without attribution. Today, that's entirely flipped. The internet is full, as we all know, of articles that have been just taken from a, give, a publication other than the Wall Street Journal, which still keeps everything behind a paywall. And another, one of the changes that's come of that is that journalists who used to never want to acknowledge someone else's scoop well, now a, a reporter for the New York Times will say, hey, this is a good story in the Washington Post, or this is a good story in the Wall Street Journal, because it's all out there already. Uh -huh. There's not much point in trying to keep it secret. This is not uh, the stuff of which uh, nations rise and fall, but I think it's just kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, we have a, uh, a, I'm going to take another shot at a video question, <laughs> and we have one on the private sector, which I think we've got an, actually a number of questions about I've lost my sheet, but we do have, I know, a, um, an image, a uh, video question on the private sector, if we could see that. My name is Alex Merrill, and my question for the panel is, what are the responsibilities of the private sector when it comes to free speech? And what constitutes, where's the line between censorship, which comes from governmental bodies and sort of de facto censorship that happens when, say, the, the NFL gets involved with its players' protest or something like that, when people lose their jobs because of something they said in a public forum. It's a good question. Anyone? Well, if you consider individual American citizens as the private sector, <laughs> as opposed to being a, an institution, it's, a, it's everybody's job, as we talked about earlier. And there's, there is no, for example, uh, uh, Federal Bureau of the First Amendment. You know, you're not going to get arrested <laughs> by anybody in the federal government right. for violating the First Amendment. It depends on those, that civic involvement of everybody, including lawsuits occasionally, but, it, but uh, also just exercising your rights when you have the opportunity. But what we said, be, what we started out with is the fundamental difference is the First Amendment itself, what we're talking about, the Constitution, is only a restraint on the government actor. Right. actor. It is not a restraint on the private employer, the NFL or <laughs> IBM or anyone. The, they're restrained by norms within their community, their industry, and what their employees will tolerate, and, but market. not the First Amendment, the market. What, what, a larger issue when I hear private you know, sort of censorship, I, I go to sort of corporations, those who have monopolies on information now, like Facebook and mm -hmm. Alphabet, you know, Google's parent company, and how they're censoring, either through the bots and trying to kick off accounts, rightly so, maybe for fake news, but that is a, that's private censorship. So I think we get up in arms about government censorship, but we have it happening with Facebook, we have it up with Google, you know, kicking off, uh, you know, whatever, you know, uh, content. And I think that's a huge area, is that we're leaving it up to private private corporations now to sort of be the gatekeepers, uh, as opposed to nobody being a gatekeeper if we want to have absolute freedom, right. or, you know, the government may be uh, doing that. And it does kind of go back to a little bit of how do you, you know, how do you categorize uh, Facebook? You know, is it like a telephone company, you know, which is a common carrier, they're not, you know, liable for that kind of content, or is it more like a newspaper, which is liable in that way, or is it something completely different? Um, we seem to not even ask those questions anymore. <laughs> in do you? Silicon Valley, they're very, they're very much struggling with this, uh, you know, today as we speak, over what their responsibility is. They used to consider themselves just sort of a chalkboard, and you know, it's not our job about who put what on the chalkboard. Right. It's just our chalkboard. Well, that that is changing, but they're they're not used to, they're trying to figure out how to be editors, the way uh, a number of people in the traditional news business could tell them, and. Unfortunately, I think their initial response is, well, we'll have, we'll build more algorithms so the robots can find this yeah, stuff. Yeah. Uh, only Apple has, has started to hire more humans, which I think because of the, all these gray areas, you really need to, to 
uh, can control the private sector appropriately and, and still respect First Amendment rights. I, I agree. YouTube is also using humans. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's probably, it is a, must be a massive task given the amounts of information they're processing. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you that uh, they need to keep a better eye on it through human judgment and not just the logarithms. Uh, Dan, I wondered if on campus, uh, since you did raise this issue, are you finding that students are a little more skeptical about Facebook and Twitter and, and other apps? Uh, that's a gr it's a great question. I don't know if they're skeptical. They're just not using it as much. I think what they're, they're using more of Snapchat right. and Instagram. And I think, you know, Facebook is for the older generation. Now, yeah. Which, yeah thank you. Somewhere Thanks. younger than me, I guess. <laughs> yeah. so, somewhere in there. Um, but no, they're not that concerned because there's sort of, so that goes back to the larger issue too, is that there's, there's these evolving sort of uh, perceptions of the First Amendment, what's allowable, and like, you know, so what, what's the big deal? Um, you know, if, if, if you, um, you know, don't put it out there if you don't want people to, to see it, that kind of reaction in that way. I don't think they look, it's, it, the bigger issue I think on, on, on campus is really about hate speech and whether we should allow that on campuses or not, I think in that way. But in terms of the social media, you know, a lot of my students, they don't, they don't really yeah. worry, worry about that in that way. Interesting. I have a, a former colleague who had a very good job in, in journalism and for various uh, personal reasons accepted a job at Facebook. And this is maybe about four years ago. And I think generally her friends would say, wow, that's, you know, she's going to make big money and it sounds yeah. kind of interesting, exciting. And she is generally, I don't know exactly what she does, but she's generally in the uh, senior management public policy area. And I think how that job, which seems so golden, has been tarnished, at least from afar, in, in the challenges that they are facing. And that, that's just really in, I'd say, two years, you know, and since mm -hmm. the... Uh, 2016 elections, and then well, and the Congress Cambridge getting Cambridge Analytica. Yeah, right, that's right, Facebook. Cambridge Analytica thing with uh, the Trump campaign, the Republican campaigns. It's uh, it's going to be just very interesting to see how that all plays out over mm -hmm. time. The thing is, right now we live in such a divided country, and Congress is so divided. There just very seems very little consensus about what to do, even though it is not necessarily a partisan issue and uh, you hear things on both sides. Right. And it gets confused I think even further because people involved in the conversation start talking about the platform. You know, well which computer are you using, which which app are you using. It's really a civics issue. It's not a not a which platform are you using right. issue. And that, that discussion doesn't get doesn't uh, get talked about much mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. Yeah. So we have touched several times on campus censorship and we have a, a video question that I would like to go to. It might bring us to another aspect of it. If we could see the, the campus censorship question. Uh, free speech is the ability in this country to follow the Bill of Rights and to exercise your rights to, to, to freedom of speech. And I don't care what side of the issue you're on, you have a right to what you say. What's going on, in, I think, in the colleges right now is they are abusing the right of others to speak out. So what's happening, particularly when conservatives try to come out of campus, they're completely um, uh, censured by the students. And I don't think that's right. So just like the students should have a right, so should people coming out of the campus have the right to free speech. We should all have free speech. What do you think, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> you're, the, you're the campus guru. Campus, you know, don't, don't make me that. Uh, yeah, I think we should always have more free speech. But, but it is interesting from, from, a, from a campus's point of view or a college university point of view is that, you know, if you bring a controversial speaker in, um, first of all, do you really need to bring that controversial speaker in? What's the reason for that controversial speaker if they're going to be, you know, if, if it's for pedagogical reasons or if you want to, you know, bring ideas? Or is it really just bringing someone to campus just to stir up a debate, uh, you know, to sort of get people, you know, passionate? And then, and then you kind of move into the eminent lawless kind of maybe action. I don't, I don't know in that way. Uh, but, I, but I personally think that we, uh, all, all voices should be heard, um, or at least all voices should have the opportunity to be heard, um, whether people want to 
go to those again or not, that's up to those individuals. I think that's missing in this kind of, kind of thing. So I, I personally don't agree with, you know, just, you know, censoring or yelling or, you know, not, not allowing people to come to campus. Um, but certainly you also do have to make sure that it's going to be protected, that there's, you know, it's not going to be, you know, violence erupting because of protests and things like that. And that's where then if it's, if it's a lot of cost, who's going to pay for those costs for the security? Uh, those are the, that's what happened out in Berkeley when uh, conservative speaker tried to do that. It was over $125,000 for security. Wow. Should the stupid student group who brought that person to campus be responsible for that, or should that be the campus itself, or should that be the city itself, right? Huh. So there are these other kind of issues that we have to think about that maybe someone might, you know, you know say, hey, well, you censored that person, but there might be all these things behind that, you know, um, uh, that make it why somebody's not coming to campus or why it's a little bit more difficult to come to campus. Well, can I vehemently agree with Dan on this? <laughs> <laughs> as long as you don't get violent. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, one of the legitimate and consistent complaints about <clears throat> these fake news platforms, whatever it is you're addicted to, is that they're echo chambers and that you just hear right. back yes. what right. you yes. believe uh, and, and your bias is built into that app on a campus you have the opportunity to hear the other side of whatever that is in ways that that app is never gonna, gonna show you because it's a, you know, what we call in DC a self-licking ice cream cone. You know, it just perpetuates uh, one view. So I think that that's a really good argument to have uh, <laughs> controversial speakers mm -hmm. on campus. I can remember uh, hearing during the Vietnam era uh, uh, people from who were opposed to it I, and in a way that I would never have thought of uh, if I just heard the standard view. So I think that's an important function of campus speakers. Ben? I agree with both Dan and Chet. And <laughs> I would just add that it, I think we should make a distinction between the First Amendment and free speech. The First Amendment is what the government can tell you to do or not to do. Right. Free speech has much deeper philosophical underpinnings about the, the virtue, the good things for society or for a, gr a smaller group of allowing everyone to share their ideas and trying to get to the, the best result. And I think there are institutions in this country smaller than governments like universities or other academic institutions where those policies should be put to use. You know, maybe a private employer doesn't want a marketplace of ideas going on and they can uh, tell people to be quiet and get back to work. But a university is a place where uh, those philosophical underpinnings really uh, have value and come to bear. Well, they should. Um, and I was going to say that uh, just like uh, Facebook and, and Twitter uh, began to suffer some reputational erosion over the last couple of years, over maybe a longer period of time, I think uh, universities as, de as defined in major national media, and I would say that in many cases this refers to the Ivy League or Northeastern universities, um, many of those, you get the impression from afar, uh, have faculties that pretty much think all in one direction, with some exceptions. And they teach the students, the students then, you know, have an idea of what is tolerable within their uh, particular atmosphere, and um, they'll protest a, a given speaker. I had uh, experience in my uh, semi-retirement after I left the Boston Globe. I worked for 12 years at my alma mater, the University of Notre Dame, which is in Indiana and is not uh, exactly a replica of, in many ways, of course, because of the religious affiliation, but of an Ivy League university. In fact, uh, in at least two of the recent presidential elections, when they uh, did polls of the students on campus. It more or less reflected the national, uh, not in the case of the last election, because they were overwhelmingly, I think, anti-Trump, but in the previous two elections, more or less came down the way that the actual election turned out. So there's a mixture of ideologies that are fomenting, and they have not had these kinds of problems that other universities have had. They had Ann Coulter, speak. Uh, they had the gentleman who uh, caused the ruckus at Middlebury, the fellow from the Manhattan Institute, who I've actually met, but I'm drawing a blank on his mm -hmm. name. It goes with my demographic. Um, they've had them come to campus without particular incident. There have been protests. You know, there have been people turn their right. back. And then actually when Obama came, uh, 
uh, at the 2009 commencement, right. uh, although a lot of that was fomented by uh, anti-abortion forces who were not part of the university community, there was a lot of protest there. Um, though in general, uh, Obama was accepted and, and actually uh, the commencement went off without too much of a hitch. But I do think that, you know, we can talk about Fox News and MSNBC as echo chambers that came up before. I uh, do think that some universities have that particular problem so that uh, there, it, it's a greater challenge, Ben, to bring those, you know, digressing points of view to the campus without incident. And I think that's kind of too bad because, as I said, uh, if you go back, I, I'll take an arbitrary time frame of, say, a decade, universities were generally, generally held in high regard. And today it's a more complicated picture, uh, partly because of these kinds of incidents. But um, it, it, we're not going to solve that here today. It's just <laughs> it's something I wanted to expound on. It's, it's one of these areas I actually know something about having worked there that uh, I wanted to uh, give the benefit of my experience. Uh, a question that came from a member of the public, and we again have touched on the private sector some, do employees of a private company have a right to free speech in the workplace? How does that play out? Again, it's not a government rule. Um, what would we say to that? How would we explain that to the public? I turn to the lawyer. <laughs> I am not an employment lawyer. <laughs> Let me uh, give that disclaimer. But, Nicely uh, done. <laughs> I think it, as long as you're not violating some employment law, um, you know, geared toward people's civil rights on the basis of um, sex, national origin, race, or some other protected class, then an employer can tell someone not to say something. Uh, and, you know, kind of like I alluded to earlier, you could say, get back to work. We're not having the marketplace of ideas in this private workplace. <laughs> right, uh, right. What if it wasn't speech uh, per se, but you had an offensive cartoon? editorial cartoon or offensive something like, you know, post it Post up. it on your, your yeah. cubicle. Yeah. I think that would go toward the employment laws. Um, okay, right. you know, if, you're, if someone's putting that up and it offends somebody else in the workplace, then you could be creating a hostile work environment by mm -hmm. keeping it there. Um, you could be harassing someone by keeping it there. So I think a lot of that would be looked at under you know, the federal and state statutes that deal with discrimination in the workplace, um, more so than under the First Amendment. Because the First Amendment doesn't apply, as we right. said, yeah. to the private yeah. sector. Right. I think, uh, I think it's interesting that some of these questions we get, those who are conversant with the amendment or with the law understand right away the difference. But clearly the public doesn't always yeah. understand that. And it did occur to me before when we were talking that although the amendment applies to government, and this is a good thing, I think the idea of free speech of the ability of in individual expression is part of our culture in this country. And that's what perhaps is being eroded now. Not the actual amendment, but that cultural uh, inspiration that the amendment has given to other activities. Like, there's a question in here about whether public school dress codes, bans on uh, t-shirts with messages on them, violate students' free speech. Now, a public school does constitute government in a sense. So is that a, is that a problem? Is that a germane problem to the First Amendment? Well, the, the typical, the basic principle is um, that public school students don't shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. That's the, that's the quote. But it's also recognized that it's a somewhat lessened or watered down right. You do not have the same uh, First Amendment rights against uh, the public school that you do against the government in general because the school uh, administrators and teacher are standing in place of your parents and they're responsible for minors. So that's why um, the school can censor a newspaper, I think you were mentioning right. before. Mm -hmm. yep. More. They can also search your locker, for instance. You don't have this, the same rights to privacy. You have some, and the, and the argument for keeping having some is that every time the school does censor the newspaper or search a student, 
they're giving those kids a civics lesson, lesson of the power of government and individual right. rights. And it's that great you want that they're to getting be... a civics lesson somewhere because they're not getting it in the curriculum, right. unfortunately. Right. Well, that's a whole other thing that yeah. I mm -hmm. think we probably all agree on. I think that on. is also one thing when we talk about the First Amendment, there's always sort of this balancing between two different rights. So like if you know, a student in high school wears a shirt that you know, has uh, obscenity right. on it, you know, they, they would say that's my expression, mm -hmm. right? But then you have on the other side, well, appropriateness, responsibility, whether it's going to interfere with others who are in there to learn in the classroom. Right. If it's disruptive, if it's it's disruptive to, the, to, to, to the learning environment, then you can say, sorry, go home and, you know, change it up. Mm -hmm. uh, but those are also judgment calls. I mean, you know, right. what's offensive to one school administrator might not be offensive to another. Whether a low-cut dress is offensive to a school administrator or not, you know. But usually there are policies, uh, you know, so at least there's someone, so it's not so arbitrary. Uh, you know, I know my, where my kids go, there's dress codes, you know, where they have to go, public school. Um, but it's also more about appropriateness than it is about necessarily uh, squelching expression. It yeah. can't be yeah. the, based on the content if right. it's a political expression. Exactly. One of the seminal cases on this issue involved a student who wore a shirt to school that said, bong hits for Jesus. And he went to court because he wanted the right to wear the shirt that said, bong hits for Jesus. And it, the school's rule allowing them to tell him to take it off or go home and change it was upheld. So they could restrict his expression in that form. Right. Now, if it had said, vote for whomever, and they had tried to take, tell him to take it off, then it might have been a different issue. Political speech does generally get greater protection than other types of speech. So while we're on political speech, um, there were a few questions in here, and I don't particularly think we want to litigate this exact question, but uh, there was controversy when Senator Collins uh, voted in favor of uh, Justice Kavanaugh, and there was a fund, meanwhile, being uh, organized, uh, I think it may have been like as much as $3 million, uh, to oppose, to go to her next opponent if she didn't vote in the right way. And, and I think she felt it was a f kind of a form of bribery. That part we can leave aside, but the Supreme Court has ruled, if I'm not mistaken, that political money is a form of mm -hmm. free speech and therefore cannot be regulated in any great way. Uh, but you are allowed to require identification of those who give the money in certain places and, and not in others. What, what do we think of that? Uh, is, is money in politics an expression of free speech? According to Citizens United, it is. Yeah. Uh, now, now, the question is whether we, I agree with Citizens United, and I would say I wouldn't, because I think when I look at voting as one person, one vote, not whoever has the most money can influence more, more people that way. And I think the, the, the minimal restrictions in Citizens United are so minimal to mean mm -hmm. nothing. <laughs> um, so, yes is the answer, but I don't agree with it. <laughs> right. Well, and also making the corporations somehow on par on individuals. They're people, right? Yes, yeah. that corporations right. are people with free speech rights is opened a whole nother can of worms. As a former congressional staffer, let me assure you that that train has left the station. <laughs> yeah. yeah, coming back. If you are, <laughs> not coming uh, back. Yeah. If you are on your first day of uh, assuming office, when you're first elected, your first job is to start raising money. And people do it all day, every day. The Collins uh, uh, incident was an interesting, dramatic, singular example of that, but it happens across the board every day, and that's why we have a Federal Elections Commission where you can go and, and check to see who's given what to whom. Right. Uh, it's, but it's been in practice for you know, forever, and it's not you, likely to change. But there's still, there's still like dark money, though, right? You still can go to the FEC, yeah. and there's you because still because of Citizens United, right? Because of Citizens right. United, you can hide behind yeah. a corporation or a dummy regulate corporation. Regulate all right. of that money flowing around the way you could before because of the First Amendment and the free speech rights of right. corporations, which was a new concept. Right. And given the makeup of the Supreme Court now, I don't think we're going to overturn no. Citizens United no. uh, within the next forty years. No, there's a move for, to uh, amend the Constitution yeah. because of the, that reality mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. it's not going to be, a, um, that the only way is to have an actual constitutional amendment. There's an organization working on that. It, it's kind of ironic that one of the few things I think members of Congress of both parties 
agree on individually, perhaps in private, not necessarily publicly, is the onerous effort that goes into having to raise money. Right. They, all, they all spend their free time trying to do it. Right. Uh, Chet, do you think there'll ever be a time when there would be an agreement that they ought to regulate it? I think the problem being, of course, that the money is more beneficial to incumbents than to challengers. Well, yeah, money is money. And, you know, whoever, uh, even people who don't need it, collect it. I got a, I got a solicitation the other day from someone who's never going to be beat in this election, but he wanted more money so he could give away money yes. to somebody else and thereby build his power. So it's the, it's the, it's been the coin of the realm, you know, forgive the pun, that, uh, that's the way it, it, it works in Washington. There's been a number of attempts. Uh, it's not like people have ignored this, but every time that there's a, uh, an attempt to regulate it, something like Citizens United comes along and right. knocks it down and they have to, have to try it again. Most of, the, most of the violations you hear of are violations of what were supposed to be fixes uh, that, that didn't work. And so we haven't found that, uh, that, that uh, area where it can be regulated and still meet uh, uh, jurisdiction uh, or uh, judicial review. Right. Um, to go from the uh, micro to the macro, uh, which is kind of where, where we started, uh, what, are, what are the conditions of society generally, uh, the world we live in, in other words, that you think may threaten, if, if they are threatened, these First Amendment freedoms? Um, you know, we talked about the internet, uh, media and television in particular, uh, are still very uh, powerful. Uh, money in politics, uh, the, the coarsening of our political dialogue, uh, our political speech is, uh, I mean, would we be having this session 40 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, thinking that the First Amendment might be under some attack. I'm really not sure. I don't mean to presume that I know the answer to that question. Uh, Ellen, you wrote a book 20 years ago. Yeah. What, was, what was the... Let's we'll start there. Then we'll go to Let's start there. Yeah, what was the thinking then versus the thinking now? The thinking then was very different because I, I, the things that we have touched on. The campus speech in this generation and the idea that some on the right call the snowflakes mm -hmm. and the idea of trigger, that is all wholly new with essentially my children's generation. And then the other is the gatekeepers. Um, we were talking to, we knew who to go to, to talk to about these uh, issues. Uh. And there really were a handful of people. and. Although it's too much of a free-for-all now, maybe, on the web, I don't think you're going to see anybody outside of the elite group who used to control everything bemoaning the fact that there are no longer a handful of white men in executive suites deciding what we all see. Yeah. Um, and the choices that are out there, and for me... The biggest difference is something that we never had to talk about 20 years ago, which I talk about all the time now, which is the most important thing for kids, and we talk about civics education, is for people to be educated on consider the source. Where did it come from? Because mm -hmm. we don't have the gatekeepers yeah. anymore. Right. And now we have to be. And that's fine, except for I don't think that we're being educated to do that. And I actually think it's a job in schools. I think it's a job for parents, starting with young kids. Mm -hmm. I tried to do it, too. But I think assessing the information that's out there is as important as accessing it. That's a very good point. And there are courses uh, that are generally referred to as news literacy that I think are being taught at the college level. But I think the high school level is probably grade school more important. Yeah, grade school, even really, yeah. just because they're all on there. And you know, I started with my kids if they just came home with gossip, and I would say, "Oh, who's where did that come from?" Now let's consider, you know, yeah, and exactly. do that with what you read online too. I've, uh, I'm going to put in a plug here for the Maine Humanities Council has a uh, uh, 
stable of speakers, I'm one of them, full disclosure, to discuss these very issues around the state. Right. And we've had, uh, Ellen's obviously read my speech in this regard. <laughs> 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 because that's Great. exactly the point that uh, we make in the, some of our earlier discussions at libraries, which is when I was growing up, you know, back when the earth was cooling and dinosaurs roamed, the, there was a lot of reinforcement every day. You know, the newspaper, the, the TV, the Boy Scouts, the church, the, uh, you know, these institutions reminded me, and sometimes subtle and sometimes not, even, you know, for example, starting today with the Pledge of Allegiance, I don't think kids do that anymore uh, mm -hmm. because there's been some court case throwing it out or whatever. Th those sorts of corny old American values, not which court case or which regulation we can dream up, but those, I think we need to return to those old fashioned values and which ignore the platforms and ignore the, the uh, uh, individual uh, rights, uh, but you know, don't conflict with them so that that's where I got my guidance and I don't see that in our society today. We need to reinforce those civics lessons somehow. Well, but not, not forcing people to say the pledge necessarily. Just, not necessarily. To, just, just, saying, just to make a distinction between just, my point. But, yeah, <laughs> what I'm, I'm saying is that that, that yeah. physical action of doing that every day wasn't designed that way, I don't think. But it, it just gave me a, 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 reminded me of my obligations as an American. Does anyone know what happened to civics lessons? Uh, because now it's a constant lament among at least more sophisticated uh, observers. There are independent gr civics groups in high schools, like, another, like the photography club, or the, right. the, it's, yeah. there's the a civics, civics group. group. Civic groups they might have them on college right. campuses yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. But you, you said, boy, 30, 40 years ago, would we have these conversations? I think absolutely. But we would right. be talking about the, the triumph of the, fr the free press to bring down Nixon during Watergate, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so we would, we would have these... Supporting the civil rights. Movement. Supporting the civil rights and, and all those kind of things. What's changed in the 30, 40 years is the internet and social media. I mean, you know, so the platform has changed, but we still have these old sensibilities of like, where is the gatekeeper? Well, there's not one. You, you know what I mean? And the and so, explosion of places to get information, right, yeah. even though we all stay in our society. And I think for good or bad, the, 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 you know, more the philosophical issue is that this ecosystem of the internet is that every, every piece of information is equal. You know, you, know right. I mean, you don't have the authority of a news organization. Right. You know, it, you, it's there. You can get it online, but it's competing with Infowars. New York Times and Infowars are on the same footing. And I think that's a problem. And, and maybe that's what we need to do is to sort of start thinking about, um, you know, how do we get people to, um, you know, you know, see the platform for what it is, mm. and it's it's got its benefits. Or at benefits. least know what it is, yeah, even if, yeah. the, what, if they know what Breitbart is, and they go, yeah, that's where I want to get it. But at least they know where they're right. getting it right. from to consider the source. Right. It is interesting that, and, and I I don't discount the fact that in many ways, let's say 40, 50, 60 years ago, uh, things were at least simpler, if not better. Uh, with regard to the flow right. of sure. information, gatekeepers, and yet uh, we had McCarthyism. Senator Joe right. McCarthy, right. Wisconsin, uh, finding a well, communist. Oh, absolutely. Under every well, I think underlining that too is that as humans, we have this this, this notion of confirmation bias. I'm just going to expose myself to things that I already right. agree with. We right. had that when all we had were three right. networks and four newspapers, mm -hmm. you know, and and now. It's just becoming, you know, sort of, sort of so magnified, this, this confirmation, which there's, becomes in the echo. There's a very interesting way. exercise you can do online. The Freedom Forum in, in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., yeah. which operates the museum. Uh, right. A, a great opportunity uh, for people. Every day they put the front pages of every mm -hmm. newspaper in mm -hmm. the country on one site. So you can, you can go through that and see, oh, well, you know, 40 of the daily newspapers in 50 states had this, that probably means it's important, you know, not some off the wall. Uh, uh, th there's still some gatekeeping to be had if you, if you well, we have make a to little effort. Them. Right, That's you have to do it yourself. That's the difference is we have to and, and. That's a real good point. It's sort of the individual now has right. to become the right. gatekeeper. That has to be part of our digital literacy. That and we have to teach that. About. We have to teach exactly. that. Exactly. Right. It goes against our instincts because we are hardwired for that confirmation bias. And I think the promise of the internet was you're going to be exposed to more viewpoints, more diversity right. than you would be before. But because of that confirmation bias, it right. takes that human tendency and exaggerates <laughs> it because it allows you to create your own echo chamber. Right. And I think the difference with the internet from 
the, uh, the way that tendency manifested itself in the past was you used to go out and continue to interact with people. And there's a great book called Bowling Alone, which is probably mm -hmm. 15 years old now, right. and talks about the it's erosion of our, of our right. absolutely, probably more relevant Reunity. than it was then. Our civil society used to require us to get out and bump into people who were different from us. You, mm -hmm. Even if you're in an all-white town in rural Maine, you're still running into uh, the Trump voter if you're a Hillary voter, a Hillary voter if you're a Trump voter. And you're, I think you see the humanity in that person. You have some mutual esteem, even if you disagree. Right. And I think we've lost that. We've lost the esteem and the trust for people on the other side. Yeah, that's a very good point because uh, I think we always knew that, let's just make some generalizations, that rural America looked at things differently than coastal urban America. Right. Uh, and yet uh, it was just kind of accepted as an interesting difference, not a confrontational one, not that they were diametrically opposed to you. And I don't know whether the internet contributed to that, but today it's, it's a uh, passionate divide. Whereas before, I think it was kind of a just cultural observation that you made and yet it didn't necessarily threaten your way of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's, that's simply what we're and facing. The, the teaching of media literacy can easily be incorporated in a strengthened civics curriculum in, mm. in our schools. And in fact, let me plug a, a, a main resource. Bowdoin College Online has a great uh, four or five question process for challenging, is this fake news or not? Right. Mm. So it doesn't, you know, you don't have to go to school for three years to figure this out. There are some pretty simple ways if you if you adjust your critical thinking skills, and Bowdoin has a great example of that uh, mm. that you could share with kids who are mm. interested in it. Uh, does anyone have any idea why civics lessons as a part of a <laughs> rudimentary curriculum in, in It's school? not on the SAT. <laughs> you think? <laughs> yeah. Right, it's because yeah. they teach right. the test. Yeah. Right. But I wondered if also our political divides led to that, that uh, you know, people didn't agree on what civics lessons should be. But they were pretty basic. They were, you know, how a bill becomes law, or what Congress mm -hmm. does, yeah, but what the, the judiciary What does. Alan said, the teachers I have spoken with on this very topic say exactly that. Their performance is rated on teaching to the test, test results, right. not uh, civics. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's a loss, I think. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> one aspect of uh, the First Amendment that we have not discussed is freedom of religion. Uh, do any of you feel that this freedom is being narrowed or impinged upon in any way? Which I know one? There are some because feelings. they're in conflict with each other, that con Congress will not establish a religion <clears throat> or in prohibit the free exercise thereof, so they're always constantly in conflict with each other. Um, that the Congress can't support one religion, Right. the government can't support one religion, but sometimes by protecting one person's free exercise of religion, it, it infringes on somebody else's exercise right. of religion this, or it appears to establish a religion. Yes, and we've seen this uh, both in the healthcare issues uh, mm -hmm. with regard to birth control provisions right. and also in, uh, the, uh, uh, in gay issues where somebody didn't want to make a wedding cake for mm -hmm. a gay couple, that sort of thing. Um, is that dramatically different than 50 years ago? I mean, those were not the issues, but this, this uh, you know, tension between religion and state, was it any different then? Anybody know? The no, court is more conservative, obviously, right. now on right. this. So. I mean, we did have a prayer in school, prayers in school issue goes way back. Right. Probably 60, 60, 50, was, 60 years. Yeah, that was in the um, 60s. And that was actually uh, a secular decision, so to speak. And then some of the decisions more recently, I think you're alluding to this with a more conservative court, right. have been a little bit more on the religious side. Well, the, for instance, making the cake for the gay couple. There was a time when we all thought that question had been answered by Justice Scalia, of all people, who in another case where uh, Native Americans were asserting their free exercise of religion to smoke peyote, which was against the law, mm. um, and it was struck down, and <clears throat> Justice Scalia said um, that even though it infringes on your free exercise of religion, 
every man would be a law unto himself. We can't have that. And right. So everybody thought, well, that answers the making the cake. But it doesn't under this court, right. which we learned with the Hobby Lobby case, with the, mm -hmm. um, the insurance requiring that it covered co contraceptives, right? That was, yeah. And everybody thought, oh, well, it's going to be the same thing. You can't be a law unto yourself if the insurance says you have to provide contraceptives, then you do. Same with the pharmacist. You can't say that's, um, that's against my religion to um, prescribe, to, fulfill, to fill your prescription for contraceptives. And it's like, well, then don't be a pharmacist because yeah. that's, you can't be a law unto yourself. But they ruled the other way and said you could make an exception for that. So freedom of religion in that regard in, under the free exercise part is having a little bit of a resurgence on the court. The whole uh, arc of the LGBTQ issue in this country generally uh, shows what a complex nation we are because on the one hand, uh, gay marriage is now not entirely accepted, but basically accepted and in law accepted. For now. For now. Uh, you think that's an erosion that may be in the future? We don't know. Yeah. We don't know. There's so been a willingness on the court to overturn recent precedent by in fact, legalizing gay marriage. That was um, overturning some precedent from 20 years ago. So, and now we have a completely different court, so we right. don't know. Well, uh, actually, since you, you've raised the issue, what, uh, how strong is, and I know it's not an absolute, the principle, and I know there's a legal term for it, uh, about settled law and precedent Stary that decisive. you leave it alone. You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for the easy one. <laughs> Uh, it's um, stare decisis is a norm. It's a, um, mm -hmm. a function of our judicial system that has carried on for hundreds and hundreds of years going back to English common law. It is not a hard and fast rule. Lower courts, um, lower federal courts are bound by higher courts. So a district court, a trial court in the federal system is bound by the courts of appeals in its circuit. Right. and by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is not bound by its own precedent. There's a norm that it respects that precedent, but there's also a norm that bad precedent is overturned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the, the Dred Scott decision was overturned. Um, Brown versus Board of Education overturned prior decisions. And so it is not a hard and fast rule that the Supreme Court cannot overturn its own precedent. Historically, it has done so reluctantly, mm -hmm. and um, only when its reasoning was either a result of changing times or a determination that the previous court was just wrong. It's not done lightly. Well, Justice Kavanaugh successfully uh, got at least one vote uh, clear to where we now sit, uh, close to where we now sit, in that uh, Senator Collins accepted his, his apparent claim that uh, abortion law was settled law in his opinion. It'll be right. interesting he to see. He said Roe v. Wade is. He didn't say Roe v. Wade. Because I think what happens Roe v. Is, Wade. Yes, is a lot, right. of, lot of times is we'll, we'll nick around yes. it right. and we'll right. limit, you know, but not overturn the whole. Mm -hmm. the whole yes, that's thing. a good right. point. Thank you mm -hmm. for raising that. Um, I'm going to go back to a, a, a video question, and I'm kind of intrigued by the title, because all I know are the titles of these <laughs> questions. Mm -hmm. This one is called Other People's Spaces, and I'd like to see <laughs> that one and see where that takes spaces us. Spaces and places. Sometimes your opinion could violate other people's space, so that, that could get hard to interpret how far you can go with that. And how do you determine that? Yeah, exactly. So, um, and it depends what, who your audience is, what what kind of space you're trying to express yourself in. If you're like a public figure, then you have to be a little bit more careful with your expression of how free you're willing to say certain things because your audience is a bigger audience. So. So. Thank you, and tell me your name again. Uh, Sia Vash. Sia Vash, and you're from? Houston, Texas. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, we've kind of covered uh, a lot of what that point raised, but does it provoke anyone's additional response not necessarily no but when when i heard space or whatever i was thinking of the um at least in the uh the uh, the abortion 
law area and protesting about mm -hmm. the zones of privacy or the bubble of privacy. Right. That Colorado that has a law like that. Yeah. But do you want to talk about that? Or, oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. I'll let you finish. Oh, okay. No, meaning that, that I, I think there's, there's been places where, and in some states, uh, uh, certainly when uh, anti-abortion uh, protesters, whether they can go up to someone and invade their personal space. You know, There's a that's buffer. Right. Mm -hmm. there, there is that buffer zone. And that's what I thought the question was going to be about, not you know, public versus private uh, kind of citizens in that way. Right. The, the principle, and I know, Ellen, you've written about it, the principle of privacy in uh -huh. American law and constitutional law uh, is the underpinning, I think, for Roe v. Wade, among other right. uh, opinions the, that have been rendered. Uh, do you see uh, in the general concept of privacy uh, with the internet seemingly right. eroding some of that from the outside, do you see the basic principle changing over time? Well, the important thing as a constitutional matter to know the, about privacy is the word never, never appears in, in the Constitution. Right. Yes, exactly. And that is one of the reasons, that is the legal reason Roe v. Wade is so controversial. It's not obviously there's societal reasons, religious region, reasons, but because it was cobbled together from what they called the penumbra of privacy mm -hmm. that was emanating from other amendments. The Fourth Amendment, which protects our um, against search and seizure. The First Amendment, which protects us to assemble. But um, so that's why that in particular is uh, controversial. But in a larger societal sense, the thing I learned um, in writing about privacy all those years ago, which has not changed at all today, and you see it with the kids with the social media platforms, is convenience. Believe it or not, trumps privacy all the time. All of the, the concerns we have now about the information they can get from us on our Facebook or Twitter mm -hmm. account, our mm -hmm. personal information, Back in the day, when credit cards first came out, people were appalled. Oh my gosh, they're going to know everything I bought. Yeah. And, There's going to be a list and, of everything I bought. And they do. When the Easy Pass <laughs> mm -hmm. first came out, yeah, oh my God, everywhere they're going to be gone. able to know where I was. Guess what? Everybody wanted credit cards. They wanted to be able to whiz through the toll booth. We want to use Facebook and Twitter. I wrote about. Um, this alarming new technology where you stand like this at the airport and they are going to take a whole naked picture of you. Nobody thought that would happen in the legal community. I started talking to people at cocktail parties. It was after September 11th. And the first thing they said was, will it work? Will it keep us safer? Wow. <laughs> and so th that is my take on that privacy now, which is that what we're going through with Facebook and Twitter we went through with credit cards, we went through with security at the airports, and people pick security and then convenience. And yet, uh, yeah. if do you think that, uh, we know that there's some polling on First Amendment issues which indicate that uh, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, all those have suffered a little bit. Uh -huh. And yet, I would think that if you ask the question about privacy, people would at least give lip service. I think you made a very good point. No, absolutely. <laughs> people are, speak very strongly on behalf of it, but then when you start going through the specific, choices right? they right. make yeah. in their everyday life, they want to go through the Volun toll Voluntarily, you know. Whatever. Which is why <laughs> these things keep happening. If people exactly. didn't post anything on Twitter, it wouldn't be there, and nobody would be able to get your account information. The, the people who worry about government surveillance, if they could see what the private sector has access oh, to with, with credit checks, it's, oh my God. As, a, got, as one of the founders of TSA, let me tell you, those, <laughs> those, those guys way outstripped whatever the oh, government yeah. had. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. Ben had, a, had a, an important uh, phrase earlier on this topic, which was, in Europe now, they're talking about the right to be forgotten. Yeah. You yes. know, that's really private. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and we've right. never had this, this widespread conversation as a society because of these convenience issues about what the difference is between privacy, anonymity, you know, secrecy right. and invisibility, you know, that, right. or, or the right to be forgotten. That's a whole new And level. A personal autonomy, which is the privacy under Roe v. Wade, is the idea to mm -hmm. make your own your personal agency. decisions oh. with your, yeah. 
I think it's uh, it's interesting, an, an interesting example of globalism, if I if we're still allowed to use that word, that uh, now you go to many websites because of the European rules, you get this notification right. that about cookies that yes. they are keeping track and all that so, stuff we knew, but now we have to acknowledge it because of their laws. And it's an influence that a lot of people might find surprising that European law is in some ways not governing us exactly, but influencing right. us. Well, it, oh, it, it will, yeah. though, on, online, right? It, it goes yeah. back to what Ellen said, too, though. I mean, how many of us see those warnings of cookies go, fine, click, click you yeah. know, or allow, <laughs> right, or do whatever. Right. The almighty X. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, so, yeah. so that, that is that notion of privacy and how much do I want to protect. Self-inflicted. You know, it's self-inflicted, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, we, we've consciously or not made the choice right. a lot of times. Well, speaking of the global issues, the, uh, there is also another question on the uh, video questions uh, titled non-citizens. So I think it'd be interesting to see what that question was. If we can have non-citizens, please. Hi, I'm Jackie Murphy, and my question for the panel is, do non-citizens have the same rights to free speech as citizens? Yes. Well, I haven't the slightest yes. idea. Yes. They do. yes. Yeah. Yes. The Answer. The, yeah, question and question asked and question answered. Well, the First Amendment is a limitation on Congress, uh, yes. on the government. Congress shall make no law. It doesn't, and it doesn't say anything about citizen or non-citizen. No. And again, going back to my security background after 9/11, we learned quickly that anybody who sets foot in the United States has the rights and uh, due process and other things of American citizens, regardless Except of where they're the from. Except at the border. Right. There is a, <laughs> there's literally a, a space you can which measure. Which is getting bigger all the time around the border where the rights and immigration proceedings. Th that's a different panel. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to, I was going to jump there in. Is, there are exceptions. In, but but you, know, yes. well, you know what's also interesting? I did, again, book years ago. Nobody would have asked that question right. years mm -hmm. ago. Huh. That's it. So, you know, the First Amendment says the government will not make a law, but there are other ways to chill speech besides passing a law. And creating a climate of fear will do that. Mm -hmm. And th it's interesting to me that somebody now would ask that question. And I think that's based on, for non-citizens uh, on our shores, a yeah. climate of fear. Have you ever, are you any of you aware, particularly the uh, lawyers among you, that uh, a court case involving uh, what you might call, now we, we've alluded before to the traditional statement, you can't uh, cry out fire in a crowded theater when there is no fire. Falsely. Uh, <laughs> falsely. Is, has there ever been any adjudication of, of creating fear under false pretenses? When we get a lot of that, when historically we've had a lot of that. But I don't know of any, any legal cases that have okay. adjudicated that. Another thing I wanted to ask was whether, uh, we just alluded to immigration. Um, the, uh, some people might say that the, uh, the right, maybe it's not a right, but the attempt that one might make to enter our country uh, is an expression, it is an expression of a kind of freedom, but that is not in any way covered by the First Amendment, right? There's, there's nothing that applies to our borders that is represented in the First Amendment. And the, and the need to protect borders, the government's responsibility to right. protect borders would trump anything, no pun intended, but would trump anything. Um, it certainly, if it comes regard. under national security, also right. right. I mean, you know. which a border is automatically right. Uh, falls right. Under. Yeah, and Ellen's right. There's a no man's land at every border that is nobody has the rights that you think you have. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and and what part of the Constitution is that actually? <laughs> the, the right. I mean, the right to protect the borders is in the chief executive's prerogatives. Where does that? Yeah, I would think yeah. so. Yeah. You're getting into the articles. I wrote on the Bill of Rights, the, ten, the amendments. You're, that's in the articles. Yeah, you, didn't do, you don't do no, articles, do just articles. amendments. <laughs> it is, it's the executive. Yes, the executive. We took constitutional law classes, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Um, we have a question, uh, and again, I'm not exactly sure of where it goes, but uh, it is denoted only by the name Seth, who's the person that asked the question. But let's take a look at Seth and see what, what issue he brought up. 
What kind of world do you want? And how are you going to get there without a, without, without a very liberal interpretation of free speech? I missed the first words there. What, what kind, kind of, of world, world do you, do you oh. want? want? Oh. oh. I think, as you mentioned, that we have a fairly liberal interpretation as of now under the First Amendment laws. Wouldn't you say? I think so, too. I think even if you compare us to Europe, the other advanced democracies in the world, we have a liberal interpretation of the right to free speech. Europe mostly is more restricted because of those privacy rights that they recognize, which are often in tension right. with First Amendment rights. Um, so I would agree. I think if you compare England standing, restricts the press in ways we oh, don't. Yeah. Their defamation right? laws are oh, far stricter. Both yeah. in and there's uh, a secrecy act. That yeah, the secrecy you. act regarding government activities mm -hmm. and also libel laws and, uh, and law enforcement with regard to the coverage of trials. There, there are rules about that that we would find pretty restrictive. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and that's yet, our closest um, ally. And, yeah, and, we, and I think they feel, mm -hmm. going back to what we talked about in terms of public attitudes, I think they, most people in, say, let's take England as an example, feel that they have freedom of the press. Uh, Japan feels that they have freedom of the press. Japan's kind of interesting because uh, it's, it's cultural and it's a consensus-based society right. in which oh. kind of... Uh, the press is group oriented and follows certain principles and it's the little publications like uh, the print equivalent of BuzzFeed that do the more radical reporting and the more uh, aggressive investigative uh -huh. reporting. It's a, there's a whole seminar on that that we could get into. <laughs> I'm married to a Japanese woman so I understand a little of this. Uh, now, it brought up this sort of the term interpretation. I don't know if the panelists want to talk about this. Like, we hear nowadays more about an originalist point of view or interpretation, right? What exactly would you say is an originalist <laughs> view, and is that going to get us to be a more liberal society? You know, I was thinking about that in advance of um, today's panel, and the short answer is I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. I was we, looking at. I think this is a great topic. Could you explain a little bit for people who were not law students and lawyers, what is meant by an originalist interpretation of the Constitution? Sure. So there are two related concepts. There's an originalist interpretation and a textualist, and oftentimes they're conflated. An, an originalist interpretation tries to determine, tries to get into the mind of the founders and determine what were they thinking at that time. Mm -hmm. A textualist, textualist interpretation looks at the language itself, the words on the paper, and tries to figure out an interpretation based on what that text says and not, not going to extraneous notions of today's values or historic values. Um, the Federalist Society, which has gotten a lot of buzz recently because that's where, that's a um, legal society of conservative and libertarian thinkers that uh, has tried to influence the makeup of the federal judiciary and it's where Trump is picking his judges from, adherence to the Federalist Society school of thought which is largely a textualist and originalist school of thought. Um, so freedom of exercise of religion is something that they are big on. Uh, first, the Second Amendment rights, uh, something that they're big on. I was looking into their thoughts on freedom of the press, and it's not entirely clear to me where they stand. Hmm. There's been a lot of buzz recently about um, how the left is cracking down on free speech at universities, and so they've been right. rah, rah, rah proponents of mm -hmm. Uh, free speech in that context, but as we've seen, free speech is not very political because it benefits both sides and it can harm both sides. Um, so I don't think there's a black and white answer to where they come down on that, it, unless Ellen, you well, might I know more I have a problem about with me. the whole originalist and getting <laughs> right. into the mind of the framers. Well, thing. in that, because you, you mentioned the originalists who are like, oh, let's go back and see what was in their mind, which means that we should understand what society was like at that point, right? And textualists are there. What would you call a judge who actually looks at society and says we're evolving and we need to change? That is that like where? Because I've read like the living constitutionalist kind of kind of. I, I would use that term. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I have the. My issue with originalists are that, for instance, if you look at the Fourth Amendment, which prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. Now, a search at the time of the Constitution was going through your pockets or your desk drawers. Now, 
That's eavesdropping on conversations, it's wiretapping, it's, it's all sorts of electronic surveillance, things that were never contemplated by the, um, by the founders, but we consider a search and we consider mm -hmm. that. And so I don't understand how you can say we have to limit it to what they were thinking at the time because we're way past that right. mm -hmm. with a lot of our laws. We're, we're beginning to get short of time, but I wanted to stay on this for one second because you alluded to the Second Amendment, which I, I understand when people really quarrel with the originalist concept there. That here they were talking about uh, raising militia, keeping a well-appointed militia, and that translating that into uh, freedom of control over any weapons you know, in society today. It's... Am I right in thinking that with regard to the First Amendment, it holds up pretty well today based on even an originalist theory? I'm sure they can play out certain theories about uh, finer points, but that the basics of the mm -hmm. freedoms that they established uh, hold up pretty well today to anyone's interpretation. Or am I wrong on that? I think it's an the issues we have today are an easier analog with the issues in the past than they are with something like the Second Amendment right. where the technology and the society has changed so much that um, it's hard to apply the thinking of the past to today. Right. Easier with the First Amendment. Right, right. And I think that uh, I think this discussion today, uh, really we covered a lot of the various subpoints, and uh, I think that it's worked out pretty well. It's a living document. Uh, it's something we cope with every day. It's changed even in the last, as we said, 40 years, uh, and will change in the next 40. But uh, it, uh, it certainly is, and as I alluded to before, it has inspired a way of thinking that applies beyond the government into what Americans believe is sort of our birthright, and that's to be able to say and do what we want with certain limitations. So I thank you all for being with us. Thank you.